Video two of the War for Independence. The game plan here is we're going to catch uh, the big battles and talk about the effects. So let's see, we're going to start here with the Battle of Saratoga. And if you only know one battle in the, in the entire scheme of the American Revolution, uh, Saratoga, well, it's, it's, it's an important one, and here's why. The British decided uh, their game plan was to cut off New England from the south. So to do that, you cut through New York. So the game, the game plan for the British was to go after Albany, uh, New York. To get from point A to point B, uh, there were three groups of uh, three generals here. We had General uh, General Burgoyne, General Howe, and well, Colonel Ledger. Uh, they're going to all kind of converge uh, on Albany. The problem is, uh, for the British, is that they all didn't get there when they were supposed to get there. Colonel Ledger is going to be dragged down because he's got to get from point A to point B and he can't, he can't uh, get through the mud and, and the hills and the mountains and the forests with his cannons. And General Howe is going to be delayed and so it's only going to be gent uh, uh, General Burgoyne who's going to show up at Saratoga. So, turn it on. Very good. So, um, General Burgoyne has uh, 6,000 men, and he's going to show up at Saratoga, where he's going to be met by General Gates. Uh, General Gates, one of the, the good guys, right? General Burgoyne, the British, and General Gates, the American. Uh, General, uh, General Gates is going to have, let's see, eight, I'm sorry, Burgoyne has 8,000, and, and Gates has 6,000. And so, uh, Burgoyne was not expecting this. So there's going to be two battles here at uh, Saratoga. The first battle is going to be a, oh, wait, who are all these people? And then they're going to start shooting each other, and it's going to end up uh, kind of like a tie, and Burgoyne's going to retreat. And so then he's going to wait for a couple of days, actually maybe a week or so, it's like a long time, and then he's going to, uh, they're going to attack again. And ultimately, uh, Gates' Gates's group is going to win. So, uh, okay, it's a battle out in the middle of nowhere, right? Saratoga, New York, you've never heard of it. Um, so what? Well, there's a lot of so what's with regard to this, this particular battle. First of all, let's talk about Benedict Arnold. So Benedict Arnold, General Benedict Arnold, uh, he's the one who led the capture of Montreal. And then he tried to capture Quebec, that was from the last video. Uh, he actually hurt his leg in that and had to be carried off the field in Quebec. So he's going to he's going to uh, he's going to uh, try to get promoted, promoted, and promoted. And Washington uh, is not. I mean, he likes him and everything, but uh, he's going to put him under the command of Gates. Arnold and Gates, the two generals, they do not see eye to eye. And basically, Arnold says something about Gates's mama or something like that. And so Gates relieves uh, General Arnold, Benedict Arnold, of command. Uh, so during the first battle of Saratoga, he was relieved, and he was told, you're out. During the second battle of Saratoga, just those couple of days later, uh, he, uh, General Arnold decides, forget that, and so he's going to lead a assault uh, of cavalry, and he's, uh, cal cavalry, and he's going to uh, be very successful. And in fact, without General uh, Arnold's uh, advance, uh, we might not have won at Saratoga. So he is like the hero. He's, he's the hero of Saratoga. He also hurt his same leg, his poor, poor little leg. He hurt his same leg in the battle. Okay. When, uh, when he gets, uh, after he gets, he gets back, and of course, uh, Howe's like, no, 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 you, no, I already fired you, you're out. So Washington says, look, uh, Arnold, uh, we appreciate what you did. You're like the hero, but eh, you went against orders, so I'm going to make you the military governor of Philadelphia. So you're out, out, of the, out of the battle scene. We're going to put you in Philadelphia, and you have to run supply lines and logistics. Well, Arnold was not very happy with that because he thought he was better to be out there in, in the middle of the battles. And so uh, he, uh, he became a little bit, well, he became upset. Uh, his wife uh, was, could uh, possibly was a loyalist and or she had relatives who were loyalists, which means pro-king. And uh, there was all this stuff going on about, well, who is Arnold actually, General Arnold actually listening to? And then it came out that uh, he, was, he was spending way too much money that he didn't have, and now he's in debt, and Washington's not taking his phone calls. 
of course, this was before phones. But uh, Washington's not paying attention to him, and nobody's, and so suddenly he decides, you know what, forget this. And he contacts the British, and he says, look, um, I happen to know the back door for West Point, the, the military academy. I know where the back door is. So uh, how about you just, you know, uh, let me come in, and uh, I'll, I'll flip sides, um, and I'll, I'll show you the back door. And so, sure enough, he turns traitor, and he joins the British side. Now, uh, the Americans find out about that. In fact, Washington uh, arranges a, I was going to say a rescue, but it would be more like a capture. Uh, he, he gets one of his uh, buddies to go pretend to flip sides and then go and, and try to sneak in and capture uh, Arnold and bring him back to the American side, not because Washington wanted Arnold to change sides again, but Washington wanted to uh, make a point and say, this is what we do with traitors. Unfortunately for Washington, uh, Arnold uh, left, he, he left to South Carolina on the day that he was, he was going to be uh, 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 removed. And then ultimately Arnold's going to go back to Britain where he's going to spend the rest of his life and die in Britain. So. Uh, the traitor, right? So in fact, today, today we even say, instead of using the word traitor, we say, well, don't be a Benedict Arnold. Can you imagine that, I mean, that your name is synonymous with, right? I mean, we have Ephialtes, who is the Greek, uh, the Greek guy who, uh, who was the traitor for the, uh, the Greeks at the Battle of Thermopylae with the, you know, the 300 Spartans. And here we have ben uh, Benedict Arnold. Um, here, here's a picture on the Battle of Saratoga, we have uh, we have some grave sites, and this particular grave site uh, just shows a boot. On on it, the boot, it says, "Oh, if I can remember this, it says the hero, the hero of Saratoga." And it says something else, but the point is that Benedict Arnold's name is not anywhere on the monument. It's just it it doesn't name him, and again, we're we're trying to make a point. Don't mess with America, and I think that's the point. Um, here we have a, another draw, a painting by John Trumbull, who's going to do all these very famous paintings for us, and we have uh, General jo uh, Johnny Bragon, that's a, a gen Gentleman Johnny, that's, that's the British uh, uh, the British general. We call him gentleman, gentleman Johnny because he always liked to be all nice and dressed up and all that, and a very proper, proper British guy, probably drinks with his pinky out when he drinks his tea. Anyway, and so he's surrendering. <coughs> excuse me, he's surrendering to uh, Gates here. Uh, you think that would be? You think that'd be Washington standing right there in the middle? I mean, it kind of looks like Washington. Washington was not there. One of the most important battles in the American Revolution, Washington was. Uh, he was elsewhere. And so, why is this important? Why? Why? This is. So, if you didn't listen to anything else so far, if you've tuned out in the past eight minutes, no, listen to this. Here's why Saratoga is important. Saratoga was the first major battle that we won, like standing nose to nose. Yes, we, we won in Trenton, but we attacked, you know, Christmas, and we attacked the Germans, and we attacked, you know, at night, and we, I mean, we cheated. So, but here's, here we're going against the British, and we're going toe to toe with them on a battlefield like mm, real men. And we won. So this is going to show that not only can we cheat and win, but we can also win playing by the rules. And if we can win one battle, we might could win other battles. And more importantly, here we have, I mean, when this battle was done and all the newspapers got hold of it, those, some of those newspapers made it across the pond, and the guys back at France are going to be reading those newspapers, and the guys in France are then going to be listening to uh, are going to be listening to Benjamin Franklin. Benjamin Franklin's gone over there because he's trying to enlist help from France because France hates Britain, and so they're trying. To, he's trying to get in, enlist help. And when uh, France finds out that we won the Battle of Saratoga, well, now Benjamin Franklin has you know he he has a, an axe in the fire that he can now use. He can say, Hey, look, guys. We're not going away. And just think, if you were to help us against the British, <laughs> wouldn't that really irritate the British king? And so because of the Battle of Saratoga, the French are going to join us. Hope you paid attention.
All right. We also have other European uh, Europeans who are going to uh, help us out, specifically individuals. We have the uh, Marquis de Lafayette, and he's going to come over uh, and be uh, George Washington's aide de camp. And so, an aide de camp is uh, 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 his the guy who's in charge of logistics. And so, we'd say logistics officer, and uh, you know George, George Washington, who you know he. He can handle he can handle A and B and C and D and E, but he not he might not be thinking about, oh man, we got to get this for the other people and so, but Lafayette, he's experienced because he's been doing all this crazy stuff in Europe, uh, fighting these battles with hundreds of thousands of guys, and now, uh, so he he understands logistics. We also have Baron uh, uh, Frederick Frederick von Steuben from Germany. Uh, not a Hessian, right? Because the Hessians are the bad guys. Uh, Stuben, uh, <laughs> Frederick von Steuben from Germany. And he's going to be famous uh, for us. He's going to come up and help us uh, at Valley Forge. He's going to be the guy who's basically the uh, one who drills our soldiers into a fighting force. So he's going to uh, train, <laughs> basically train the Continental Army in how to fire, fire volleys. And he's going to show us how to march and do quick time steps and, and how to pinwheel and do all this kind of stuff that we had not known really how to do before and now we're going to be trained by a European who knows how to beat the British. Speaking of Valley Forge, one of the low, low, low points in the American Revolution from the American point of view. Um, so General Howe is going to uh, capture Philadelphia and uh, during the winter of uh, 77, 78. He's going to capture Philadelphia right before that. And then he and his troops are going to hole up in Philadelphia in these nice warm houses, right? And have nice, you know, baked warm bread and have lots of stuff to eat. And just 20 miles, just 20 miles or so to the north, uh, Washington uh, is going to be at Valley Forge. So Valley Forge is not a really huge place. It's about 3,500 acres. Um, which is a couple square miles. Um, but Washington had several different places to choose from to hole up his army of 12,000. It wasn't 12,000 soldiers, it was 12,000 people because there's the soldiers and then their wives and some children and then all the, you know, the cooks and all the people, uh, about 12,000 people. And so uh, Washington actually uh, looked around and he had several sites to, uh, to uh, choose from. Uh, various politicians were trying to get him... <laughs> Politicians were trying to get him to stay at certain places, and so eventually he decided on uh, Valley Forge because uh, it was close enough to Philadelphia that in case something happened, he could get to Philadelphia. It was also kind of up on a hill, so he could look down in case the British were going to attack him, you know, because 20 miles away, that's you're within one day marching, and uh, the British could have attacked any time. So uh, it was a pretty good place. Here's the problem, though, with Valley Forge. Um, supply lines. 12,000 people, they got to eat, right? Maslow's Triangle, air, food, water, shelter, sleep. Well, let's start, we'll, let's start with food. Where are you going to get food for 12,000 people? Obviously, you can't just, you know, you can't just scrounge off the land um, because you're going to be there a while, you know, all, summer, all winter. In fact, he's going to be there almost six months. Um, so you got to get supply lines coming in, and so the problem is with supply lines is that you're right next to Philadelphia, which is owned by the British, and so all the major roads, you know, there's British troops, and so you got to get the supply lines, supply wagons coming in discreetly. So that's that's an issue. Um, air, food, water, shelter, sleep, water. That's okay because there's snow everywhere. <laughs> um, uh, shelter. So with 12,000 12, people or 12,000 yeah uh, people, you build about 1,300 of these little bitty huts. Right. Uh, if you go to Valley Forge National Park today, you can go and see the recreations of the huts. Uh, some of them, they talk about how uh, the soldiers would build these huts and then they would dig down you know, a foot or two feet down. So when you step, you step down into the ground um, and that way when they went to sleep, their bodies would be below ground. So when the wind came through, <laughs> wind came through all the little cracks, uh, that their bodies would be out of the wind and uh, so they'd have shelter. Uh, some of them put uh, uh, chinks of uh, you know, mud and straw to, to, to hole up the, the, 
the uh, wood there, the logs, so that it was more airtight, so you wouldn't get the wind coming through. Washington, around March, or so, sometime around March, uh, he said, guys, uh 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 you got to take that stuff out because, dude, I've been walking into some of your cabins, and, uh, man, y'all stink. So you, you need to get some fresh air to come through here. So he had all those, he had all those guys take the mud out, and so they had uh, fresh breezes come through. Why is that? Well, there was, there was disease uh, when you get 12,000 people out there, and there were no, uh, no uh, they didn't figure out latrines until towards the end. And so you got all sorts of nasty stuff going into the water, and ah! And so we had uh, various things come through. Influence was bad. Smallpox came through, although interestingly enough, uh, Washington did uh, inoculate a lot of his troops. Uh, not all of them, but he got a lot of them inoculated. So uh, with the, you know, we talked about that. Uh, and uh, so that, that worked out. But many, many, many of them uh, got sick for lots of different reasons. Ultimately, 2,000 2, men died, um, and whether it was through malnutrition or whether it was through the you know exposure to the elements or whether it was through disease or whether it was through, it's all of the above. So Valley Forge, not a good time for General Washington. Meanwhile, like I said, General uh, Howe uh, for the British, he's just 20 miles away living it up in a nice warm house. The drawing of General Washington with his troops. All right, so not just, uh, not just uh, land battles, but we had sea battles. The problem is, of course, the British, uh, the British Empire has the, the, the biggest, strongest fleet in the world at this point. So you know, what are we going to do? We don't, we don't have a navy. We've got like two or three ships. They've got a thousand ships, you know, like literally a thousand ships. And we've got three, right, for our, in our navy. So what, con what our Continental Congress is going to do here is that they're going to uh, they're going to get together a whole bunch of, well, we call them privateers. Uh, a privateer is a person who owns his own boat and uh, makes money um, uh, either uh, uh, running goods from point A to point B. I'm trying not to say the word pirate. I'm really trying not to say the word pirate, but a, a, a person who owns his own ship and runs, uh, uh, okay, so we hired a whole bunch of pirates. We call them privateers, but we all know what I'm talking about. And so, uh, to fight for us. Good news, bad news. The good news is that uh, a whole bunch of them were willing to do it. Bad news is that it cost us a lot of money to, to do so. Probably the most famous of the pirates, no, 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 definitely the most famous of all the pirates. I mean privateers, privateers. John Paul Jones, no relation. Well, as far as I know, I, mean, I guess I could be related. Um, and his ship, the Bonhomme Richard. The Bonhomme Richard. So Bonhomme is French for good man. The good man Richard. Um, and he's going to be very, 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 very successful. The most famous of the uh, uh, sea battles uh, takes place uh, between the Bonhomme Richard and his fleet versus the HMS Serapis and the British fleet. And in fact, Bonhomme Richard, which is the flagship, versus the HMS Serapis, which is the flagship for the British, they're going to get into a they're going to get on to a tete a tete a fight to the death. And interesting stories. And gosh, I wish I could spend a lot of time with this, but um, the short version is that uh, the Serapis was a little bigger, had a lot more guns, and so it was just crushing the American ship, the Bonhomme Richard. And uh, the, uh, so what uh, John Paul Jones, Captain Jones did, ooh, Captain Jones, that sounds good. Uh, what Captain Jones did was that he got really, really close to the ship and then tried to grapple the ship. And so they, he tried to tie the ships together. The Bonhomme Richard had more troops on the ship than the British uh, ship did. And so uh, they're going back and forth and trying to invade each other's ship. Eventually, um, the... Uh, uh, the captain of the, uh, the Serapis yells across and says to Captain Jones, he says, look, do you surrender? Do you give up? And John Paul Jones allegedly said, I have not yet begun to fight as his ship is sinking. <laughs> I mean, why not, right? So the Bonhomme Richard is sinking, but here's the deal. It's tied to the Serapis. So uh, eventually the American, the American soldiers uh, board the Serapis and are able to take over the crew uh, the British crew and uh, the Americans win. The Bonhomme Richard sinks to the bottom, and uh, Captain John Paul Jones takes the 
uh, Serapis as his own. Anyway, the point is we have battles out in the sea as well. A couple of drawings, there's the Rishar versus the uh, Serapis and a different drawing there. You know, uh, newspapers go, both British newspapers, or I'm, I'm sorry, loyalist newspapers and, uh, you know, revolutionary newspapers uh, both recorded the battle and both of them drew pictures of uh, Captain Jones. And so here we have Captain Jones, and you see the word Serapis in the background. You have the American flag, and he's fighting the evil British, and etc., etc., etc. And then you have over here Captain on the left, Captain uh, Paul Jones, the pirate, and you see this in the skull and crossbones on his on his hat and on his uh, belt sash, and uh, you know, right. So you you could probably guess which one of these is the loyalist newspaper, loyalist to the king. Um, or which one's the revolutionary newspaper, right? Okay. I wish I could spend days and days and days talking about individual characters in the American Revolution, but obviously we can't, so I just want to hit one or two of these guys. And so here's Nath uh, Nathaniel Hale, Nathan Hale. Um, Nathan's only 21 years old. He's going to be involved in the uh, retreat from New York by George Washington, but as George Washington's pulling out of New York, you know, running from General Howe, in his first, you know, his first O and one, uh, Washington looks around. And he says, "Hey, guys, I need some spies. I gotta have, I gotta have some boots on the ground. I gotta know what's going on." And so uh, Nathan Hale says, "Boss, I'll do it." And so Nathan Hale, 21 year old, uh, a, uh, a school teacher, in fact, uh, Nathan Hale decide, uh, he's going to stay. And he's going to be a spy. And so he's not a very good spy. Um, he pretends to be a Dutch school teacher. Okay, he's a school teacher. Pretend to be a Dutch school teacher uh, with a different name, other you know, not Nathan Hale, because Nathan Hale is known as a, as a, uh, you know, as an American revolutionary. But he, he carries in his, uh, on his person, he carries his diploma, from Yale, which has his name Nathan Hale on it. Not very smart. Terrible spy. A um, couple uh, different stories again. It's a long time ago. Nobody has the the. The exact details, but uh, different versions say that he was either uh, sold out by <laughs> by one of his relatives, or um, he was sitting in a bar. I like this one. He was sitting in a bar, and his terrible disguise—you know, a fake mustache to disguise or whatever—and somebody recognized him and said, "Hey, aren't you Nathan Hale, the Patriot?" And he's like, "Uh," and then he got caught. And then he was taken to General Howe's um, house in uh, well, his res uh, the place that General Howe had taken over in New York City, and. Uh, he, he was uh, told, no, not, not, no, you can't be a spy. And uh, he spent the night with General Howe. I, he slept in the garden or something like that. And uh, then uh, the next morning, uh, they, they hanged him. Now, why is he, Nathan Hale famous? Because they hanged a lot of people. He's famous probably uh, because of his final words. Hey, do you have any final words? And so different people record different things. Uh, but the, the standard line is he said... I regret that I only have one life to give to my country. I regret I only have one life to give to my country. So, and there are different versions of that. Uh, but there you go, Nathan Hale, spy master, <laughs> for like one day. The Battle of Cowpens. It's not one that comes up too terribly often, but I, it's kind of interesting to me because uh, this is, uh, again, Americans, we're, we're learning. We're learning how to play the game here. So this is a, a larger, a larger uh, force, a larger British force coming, coming down the road. Uh, we have a group of uh, people st uh, out in the road, and uh, uh, the British force com comes at us, and we're like, oh, no, the British force. And so we start shooting at them, and we're backing, backing up, and we're backing up, and we're backing up, and we're backing up. And the British force are like, oh, there's the bad guys. There's the, you know, those crazy revolutionaries. Let's go get them. And so they start to run after us, and if they run, then they break up their lines, and so they're no longer in those nice straight lines. So, so they're, they're breaking up, and they start running after us. And then you know they run up over the hill, and there's our army, and we just start shooting at them. And so this was a major disaster for the British, uh, suck, sucked right into our trap, uh, the Battle of Calpins. So 
our flag, right? You gotta have a flag represent our, represent the country. You gotta have those national symbols to rally behind. The Congo Congress passed the flag resolution of 1777, and so it's been, <laughs> it's a, it had a couple parts to it, but important for us, it says you had to have 13 stars and red and white stripes. <laughs> 13 stars and red and white stripes. So that was it. It didn't say what order or how to do it. It was just that was it. And so we have a couple of different versions. You have the Brandywine flag. Well, there's 13 stripes and red and white, 13 stars and red and white stripes. And you have the uh, Bennington flag, 13 stars and red and white stripes. And notice the, the white and red stripes are reversed from what we're used to. Uh, we, on the current flag, it's red on the top and red on the bottom and the white interspersed. And well, kind of like down here, the uh, Hop Hopkinson flag. And you see the different pattern of the stars than we're used to. Um, we have the Cowpins flag. So there's the Cowpins flag. Um, and then, oh, yeah, there you go, Betsy Ross, the Betsy Ross flag. And that's the one that, that's hanging over there on my wall. The Betsy Ross flag is the one that uh, everybody kind of went after everybody's going through it. They all, they all kind of settled on that, on that one. Um, we have the Spirit of 76, very famous painting by Archibald Willard. And in the back we have... That's an interesting flag that didn't exist in 76, but you know, that's what I'm here for, point out all the anachronisms. Okay, and just for funsies, here at the bottom we have the Star Spangled Banner, and so the Star Spangled Banner, if you're counting really fast, you're counting the stars. There's 15 stars on the Star Spangled Banner, because that's the one that was uh, the War of 1812. That's the one that Francis Scott Key saw at the Fort McHenry, and uh, oh, say, can you see? So that's, that's that flag, and you can go see that flag today at the Smithsonian institution. Well, I mean, it's torn up now, but, uh, and of course we have uh, the current flag with the 50, 50 uh, stars and the 13 stripes. You know, uh, the, we used to just, we also, we used to add stripes for every state too, and then they said, no, that's going to get crazy. So they went back to only 13 stripes, and they just added star for every state. Interestingly enough, and here we are in 2020, towards the end of 2020, and I'm doing that so that if we ever watch this in 35 years, then we're going to remember this and we're going to go, oh, look how pre prescient he is. Um, uh, right now, we've got the, uh, the presidential, presidential elections coming up between Trump and Biden, and uh, the, Trump, the Trump supporters are accusing the Biden supporters of, of bringing up uh, the idea of adding Washington D.C. as a state, adding uh, Puerto Rico as a state, so that way, and both of those would be Democratic states. And if you add two more states, and they get four more votes in the Senate, and you get four more votes in the Senate than than the Democrats will have, and 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 and. So, there you go. Over here, uh, 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 the uh, there was a there was a contest gosh, several years ago, that said, hey, what if we did add Puerto Rico, what would our flag look like? You gotta add a star somewhere, because that's like, that's like the rule, you gotta add a star. So how would you do that? So 51 stars. You know, our flag has 50 stars, and so they go uh, six by five by six by five by six by five by six by five by six. That's how they do it, because six times five is 30, and five times four is 20, so 50, uh, 30 and 20 is 50 stars. That's how they get the pattern. How do you do 51? 51, is 51 like a, uh, is 51 a prime number? Wait, 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 51, no, it's not a prime number, because 51 is five plus one is six, and six is divisible by three, which means you cannot be a prime number. So what is it? 51 is, oh, 17, right? 17 times three is 51? You too can do math on the fly. Uh, so how would you design a flag with 51 stars? And so here's an example, but there's uh, lots of them out there. Okay, I spent way too much time on this slide. Sorry, I'm so sorry. I'm just, I'm in this room all by myself. I'm just talking, I'm sorry. Battle of Charleston. Yeah, it didn't all go, go good for us, the Americans. The Battle of Charleston was awful. Um, our group, do I have names up there? Benjamin, uh, General Lincoln is going to uh, have uh, 5,000 troops in Charleston, and the British commander, General Clinton, ugh, General Clinton, he's uh, going to surround Charleston, uh, going to have uh, ships out in the bay, we're going to have troops come out, and we're going to start bombarding Charleston. The problem is that uh, uh, General Lincoln realizes that yeah, it's over, and so he he you know offers a truce and says, can we you know can we 
surrender and you just let us all go, you know, like men, if we promise not to, you know, go kill each other. And Clinton says, no. And so uh, Clinton orders firebombing, which basically says you, instead of just throwing out lead, you know, lead uh, cannonballs, you heat them up first, and then when you when they land onto the wooden buildings, then they set things on fire. So, uh, and uh, Clinton uh, Clinton did this, and Lincoln ultimately had to do a total unconditional surrender. And so, at the uh, when you surrender a big army to another army, you know, depending on the the commanders, then you get certain privileges, like. Um, uh, your guys are allowed to take their guns, you know, with them, with the bayonets affixed. And the, uh, <laughs> it's a weird tradition, the, the army that loses their band, yes, everybody has a band uh, in the trumpets and drums and fifes, their band has to play the victory march of the other side. That's kind of weird, isn't it? So Lincoln's band had to play the British anthem. Can you imagine having to do that today? Wow, Western Heights would be playing. No, moving on. So the point is, okay, I'm going to edit that out. No, I'm not. I'm leaving it in. It was the biggest defeat of the American Revolution for the Americans. Um, down in the south, we had General Cornwallis. General Cornwallis. And he's going to start way down in uh, North Florida, and he's going to come up. That's his game plan. We're going to smash the Americans in the middle. So he's going to come up. And uh, he's going to do pretty well, except that he's going to be hounded over and over and over by Francis Marion. So here's Francis, and we call him the Swamp Fox. If you've if you've seen the movie, if you've seen the movie The Patriot with uh, Mel Gibson, occasionally it comes on, like around Fourth of July. Uh, his his character is roughly based, loosely based on uh, Francis Marion. That basically he's uh, Francis Marion. Uh, uses guerrilla tactics, hiding behind trees, running up, shooting, and running away, running up, shooting, and running away, that kind of stuff. And he really irritates Cornwallis really much. Okay, let's just keep, let's just, uh, there's so many other battles we can talk about. Let's just jump here to the end. So the siege of uh, Yorktown, Yorktown, Virginia. Yorktown, we have Cornwallis, and uh, he's going to be, uh, he's going to be there in the city. General Clinton is going to be up in New York, and uh, General Clinton has uh, the boats. So Cornwallis gets kind of trapped inside Yorktown. Washington shows up, um, and, and other generals show up. The French generals show up, uh, Rochambeau shows up, um, and they, they start, uh, they start uh, digging trenches around, around the city, some defensive trenches around the city. So the British soldiers are in, inside the city. The Americans and the French are digging trenches outside the city. And they're, and they're making little redoubts uh, to put the cannons on. Cl uh, Cornwallis uh, gets on his cell phone and calls General Clinton and says, Hey, we've got a whole bunch of Americans here. And I don't know. They look like the... the. So how about you bring your boats? How about you bring your boats? And then we can escape out the back door. And then we'll live to fight another day. And Clinton says, all right, dude, uh, I, got, I got stuff to do, but I'll be right there. Just hang on. All right, I'll see you in a little bit. So the poor Cornwall, poor Cornwallis. The stories say that uh, uh, the Americans, the French, uh, and for that matter, some Germans, they dug the lines and they set up the cannons and one of the anecdotal stories says that George Washington was the first one to fire. He got to, you know, pss, boom, fire the cannon. I'll do that again just for the sound effect. Pss, boom, fire the cannon. And again, the anecdotal story says that cannonball went across the field into Yorktown, into a window, and smashed the table of where several British officers were having breakfast. I mean, hey, you're George Washington, right? You can do anything. So then Washington ordered the bombardment of Yorktown. And 36,000 <laughs> 36, cannonballs later. Fire, 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 fire. We call that shock and awe. We did that in 1991, 1991 against Iraq uh, during Desert Storm. And it worked out for us there, too. 
uh, 36,000 cannonballs, shock and awe. And uh, while they were firing, and this is over several days, obviously, while they're firing um, uh, Washington and his, his other generals, they start making plans to move the lines up. And so at night, they'd, they'd move the lines up and they'd dig another trench. And the British, who were keeping their heads down because the cannonballs were coming over, they'd look up the next morning and they would see the lines of the Americans were much closer. And they're like, ugh! And at one point, um, they were so close that Washington said, okay, in our next move up, we're just gonna we're just gonna affix our bayonets, you know, sharp stabby things on the end of the rifle, and uh, we're just gonna go. And so Washington said, "Go!" And then, and then, and we there you go. Cornwallis is going to uh, Cornwallis is going to find out that uh, Clinton's fleet is not going to get there in time. Oh, but good news. The fleet does arrive. Oh, bad news, it's the French fleet. So the French fleet comes in and they block off the harbor so the British fleet can't come in and Cornwallis knows it's all over. So uh, he sends out, he sends out late in October, he sends out a little bitty drummer boy and some guy with a white handkerchief and they come out and they negotiate the surrender. Hey, look at me with my big words. Here's a, a map of, of the uh, battlefield. So you have Yorktown and the fleet out, out here, and then you have the different, the different generals and the different uh, uh, colonies the, from Virginia, Maryland, and Pennsylvania, and different French guys, and where they were with regard to, uh, with regard to uh, Yorktown itself. Uh, and again, I would love to spend days talking about it, but eh, there you go. So. The rule is, if you lose and you're the commander, then you go out and you take your sword and you hand your sword to the, to the winning commander. Well, that morning, it turns out that, oh, Cornwallis, <coughs> he was a little under the weather and he couldn't make it. So he sent out his second in command to, uh, to surrender his sword. Well, his second in command came out and went up to the French commander because the second in command the British second in command was like I'm not surrendering to an American because Americans I'm not gonna surrender to an American I'll surrender to the French because you know at least the French they're honorable and so he went up to the French commander the French commander was like mm, mm mm Washington go over to Washington and so the second command of the British is like ah whatever and he goes over to Washington and uh, he offers his sword to Washington Washington's like um Nope, I'm not taking that, dude. Here's why, because uh, your boss is not man enough to come out here and surrender his own sword. So how about this? I'm going to take that sword. No, no, you're going to take that sword, and you're going to give it to my second in command. So eventually, the sword is given to the, to the right person, and they surrender. Now, uh, the British did ask for the standard um, uh, surrender uh, rules where they get to play the song and and everybody gets to come out in their nice uniforms, they get to have the bayonets, and Washington said, oh, I would love to do that, but you didn't allow us to do that a couple of weeks ago with Charleston, so, uh, no. So interestingly enough, okay, all you band people out there, you, music, you, mus, you musicians, out, well, that's hard to say, I don't know why. You musicians, you musicians out there, you musicians out there, she sells seashells by the seashore. Um, you music, you people who have a music background out there will appreciate this. The uh, the British band uh, was supposed to play, you know, obviously the uh, American songs because the Americans won. And Washington said, "No, we're not going to do that. We're not, you know, we, you know, we don't respect you enough to, you know, play our stuff, <laughs> Yankee Doodle or something like that." So instead, the British band, now this is all anecdotal, we don't have evidence, but uh, there are enough people who wrote it down in their diaries, right? Said that the British band played the song, The World Turned Upside Down. And so here are the lyrics, which is interesting to me. It says, listen to me, you shall hear, news hath not been this thousand year, since Herod, Caesar, and many more, you never heard the like before. Holy days are despised, new fashions are devised. Old Christmas is kicked out of town, yet let's be content and the times lament. You see, the world turned upside down. All right, 
because the Americans won. Here is the year 2020. We don't know that how that song goes. <laughs> we don't have the music for it. We have the lyrics, but we don't have the music. So, hey, for if you're looking for you know a million dollars, if you're a music person, you and you go through some library somewhere like you know some Vatican archives, and it's in the back of some crazy book nobody's opened in you know 400 years, and you find the music for this. I'm telling you. I want a copy of, the, or I want a cut of the profits because I'm the one who told you about it. The Treaty of Paris, signed surprisingly enough in Paris, Paris, France, not Paris, Texas. Paris, Texas doesn't exist yet. Uh, signed April 15, 1783. It was basically written by uh, John Adams and Benjamin Franklin. So here, here, here's what happens. America gets to, gets to be independent of Britain. We're going to become our own country. We're going to be the United States of America. Number two, uh, it's going to establish boundaries. And so to the north, we're going to draw a line. Those people are Canadians. We're Americans. To the south, we're going to draw a line of Florida. Those people are Spanish. We're Americans. To the east, we're going to say, well, those people live in the ocean, and we're Americans. And to the west, we're going to draw the line at the Mississippi River and say, we are Americans all the way to the Mississippi River, and after that, we're Spanish. So we're going to draw all of that out, and we're going to, we're going to demarcate that, and we're going to put it in the treaty. And uh, other parts of it include uh, the United States, <laughs> the United States promises to, quote, earnestly recommend, earnestly recommend that the states to return the rights and properties to loyalists. So if you were a pro-king guy over here during the war, and um, your stuff was taken because you know, we didn't like you because you were supporting the king, and we just took your stuff, um, that we would, excuse me, we would do our best to get that stuff back to you. <laughs> yeah, you're not getting that stuff back. But we would do our best to do that. Man, you talk about bad sports. Bad sports. Here's a painting of the signing of the Treaty of Paris of 1783. You note that we have... On the left side of the screen, we have John Adams. I'm sorry, John Jay. He's going to be our first uh, Supreme Court Justice. John Adams. He's going to be our second president. Benjamin Franklin. You may have heard of him before. And two other guys. <laughs> Henry Lawrence and William Temple Franklin. Oh, yeah, that's a, the, the son. And you see on the right side of the, of the painting, you see the British. Yeah, it's a little awkward. Uh, they, they didn't. They didn't stick around. They, they were so embarrassed that they had to sign a peace treaty with these backward hicks from America that uh, they didn't want to stick around and get their faces painted because, uh, awkward. So, I actually like this better because it shows just how petty the British are. Tea drinkers with their pinkies out. Man. Moving on. Uh, here's a copy, uh, copy of the, uh, the treaty, and you see there, there are various affixed seals down there. John Adams and Benjamin Franklin, etc., etc. All right. Four reasons for the American victory. One, patriotic spirit. It made sense. It made sp sense for us to fight. Why? Because we're this huge, big country over here, and why are we being controlled by a small island 3,000 miles away. It was common sense. We haven't really talked about common sense, but common sense that um, uh, we should be our own country. Two, we had skilled leadership. I mean, I mean, you can argue the O and 8, not so good, but George Washington ultimately came through for us. I mean, he survived the Valley Forge, and he survived some other things, but, but with his leadership and other people's leadership, you know, uh, Gen General, uh, General Lincoln and General... Uh, the other generals, <laughs> General Gates, uh, General Arnold, oh, awkward. Um, we had good leadership. Geography. See, I might argue this is one of the bigger ones because geography, we played on our home field. Home field advantage is big, right? Because we know supply lines, we know where, the, where water is, we know which mountain to hide behind. <laughs> so, we're, uh, I don't know why I cracked myself up. But anyway, that's uh, geography's big deal um, because of home field advantage. And finally, help from abroad. Uh, gosh, yeah, I mean, we have to admit it. The, the French helped us out. The Netherlands helped us out. Spain helped us out. Ultimately, Canada is going to help us out because, you know, Canada. So there were reasons. Um, 
you know, if, if you were a betting person in the year 1775, you, nobody would have put money on the Americans. I mean, nobody would have put money on us. And uh, here you go. I mean, I guess we, at the very last second, we, uh, we got an onside kick, and then we kicked a field goal with time running out. Yeah, that never happens. <laughs> Man, I wish right. All right. Hey, uh, we're going to end this up with, with two slides here. Um, George Washington. Can I, have I told you he's the man? He is the man. Here's why. I mean, yes, President Washington, but we haven't even got to that guy yet. General Washington. Look what he's doing. He's walking into the Congress, and he says, Okay, we won. I'm out. Here's my here's my resignation. I am I'm leaving. Bye. I'm gonna go back and farm. I mean that's what he literally said. I'm gonna go back and farm. I'm gonna go back to Mount Vernon over in Virginia and I'm gonna farm because you know I've done what I was gonna do. I'll see you. Now those of you who pay attention to world history, you know that hardly ever happens that the head general, the commander in chief of an army says, all right, we won, I'm out. Because usually the head general or the commanding general of an army of a nation usually says, all right, go ahead and put a crown on me and let's move on. And he did, he literally said, bye, and we're not gonna hear from him again. Well, for you know, at least a couple of months, and then of course, <laughs> that whole thing with the president. But the point is, he resigned his commission and walked away. Good for him. Results. The impact of the revolution. So here we go. The impact, and this is it. The United States of America. United. The United States of America. We are no longer 13 colonies, so I don't have to keep saying the word colony anymore. And when I, well, I say the word state, and I mean colony, and I couldn't remember which way it was. So now I can say states, unless next semester, next video, we'll go back to that. This, this articles. Ah, all right. In 1789. Oh, so this is actually kind of important, right? Because in 1789, just a couple years later, uh, the French are going to look and say, look, hey, wait, the Americans, they kicked out their king. We can kick out our king, too. And, of course, they had the whole guillotine thing. And uh, uh, Marie Antoinette, and they let them eat cake and all that kind of stuff, but that's not American history. The U.S., oh, oh, the U.S. is deeply in debt. Money. Deeply in debt and is considered by many European countries as a weakling. How do we get out of debt? How do we become an economic powerhouse? I wonder if anybody has any plans to do that. <coughs> Alexander Hamilton. I wonder if anybody has plans to get us out of debt. All right. Hey, that's the end. So uh, thank you for watching. Is anybody still watching? You probably all turned me off a long time ago. Um, doing my butterfly in the shadow. Um, thank you for watching the rise and fall of the American Revolution. I don't know, I'm just making stuff up now. I'll see you later. Be good. See you on Zoom.